It's the end of the world as we know it. Well, not really. It's the end of chemical engineering thermodynamics as we know it for undergraduates in the one semester uh, version of this course. And so I'd like to take this last opportunity for us to get together and reflect on the big picture of what's happening in chemical engineering thermodynamics. And it's traditional to actually start with the big picture and go to the specifics, but I'm gonna do this backwards. So what we've been doing all semester long is solving more or less the same equation over and over and over and over in different convenient forms. And that equation is delta G, change in free energy, is equal to delta H, standing in for energy energy, you know, enthalpy, um, minus T times delta S. So subtracting off from our energy the, uh, the tax due to entropy. And so we've been solving this all semester, and honest, we have. Um, it's just not the most convenient form all of the time. So when you think about delta G, you say, in general, what's going to happen? The universe as a whole tends towards lower Gibbs free energy. And so the things that are spontaneous, the things that are most likely to occur, are things with a negative delta G. And that describes what was happening when we were looking at uh, power plants. That describes what's happening when stuff is vaporizing. That describes what is happening uh, in reactions. And so, um, and you can think about how it is, you're like, is there something magical about delta G? No, not really. It's just that um, energy is how we get stuff done. And we can only actually do stuff insofar as uh, entropy allows it, right? Remember, we can't turn heat into work willy-nilly. There's rules on this. And this conveniently expresses that whole uh, concept in one equation. And I know um, my colleagues uh, who, who do big picture thermo will say, well, wait a minute, there's other forms of free energy, not just Gibbs. Don't be such a Gibbs partisan vigent. But I find that this, especially at the undergraduate level, this is a nice, succinct way to talk about pretty much everything that has gone on all semester. So let's look at that a little bit more closely. So as I said a second ago, we could view delta G equals delta H minus T delta S as something that succinctly describes what happened when we looked at energy and entropy balances and cycles, what we looked at when we looked at uh, fluid property modeling, especially phase change and uh, phase equilibrium, and what happened uh, as we looked at reaction equilibrium. Um, all of these things, <laughs> And you'll say, well, wait a minute, when we looked at energy and entropy balances, we didn't bring delta G into it. And that's true. And it's not because that wasn't there. It's just because it wasn't the most useful way to talk about it. Um, I have as an analogy, you know, sometimes you want to give temperature in Fahrenheit. Sometimes you want to give temperature in Celsius. Sometimes you want to give temperature in Kelvin. The setting matters. And so when you're just doing an energy balance, you don't really need to bring free energy into it because... An energy balance succinctly tells us what we want to know. So something you may be wondering about is if we're always minimizing free energy, if we're always driving towards a lower free energy, but sometimes we've done this through energy and entropy balances, sometimes we've done this through phase change and solubility, and sometimes we've done this through reaction, um, how does the system know which of these delta G's it's trying to minimize? And the thing is, it doesn't. All of these are happening at once, all the time. They are, we are always driving towards a minimum uh, free energy. It's just that when we choose examples in class, one of these uh, ways of minimizing free energy is more prevalent than the others, is more important. 
you know, so when we say there's a non-reacting system, is there a way, a chemical reaction that might have a lower uh, free energy state than the state our components are in right now? Maybe, but we know from experience that whatever it is we're working with is very stable under these conditions. So we pretend it's not uh, reacting and that's a pretty good assumption. Um, and then free energy is just minimized because the steam condenses to water rather than reacting with something. And so it means that you've got to be really thoughtful and really clever about making sure when you use your calculations to minimize the free energy that you are picking the right equations to do. Uh, because it's too complicated in many cases to look at everything at once, um, but you also don't want to miss something. You don't want to assume an energy balance is good enough when in fact reactions are happening or phase change is happening. Okay, keep that in mind. I'm going to get philosophical for a second, so you may want to skip ahead for two and a half minutes and catch up with us when we get to the actual problem of the day. But just to think about the big picture for a moment, and I mean the even bigger picture, still in thermodynamics, of uh, all of thermodynamics. So if all of thermodynamics is this pink box, we have not learned about all of it. We have not even learned about most of it. Um, the whole of thermodynamics, and I would say as a convenient rule of thumb, this is looking to minimize the free energy of the entire universe. That entirety of thermodynamics really falls under the heading of physics. Uh, physics is the discipline that kind of worries about soup to nuts, how this whole uh, thermodynamics thing interacts with everything. And this little circle here is what's happening in chemical engineering thermodynamics. And next to us is our friend uh, chemistry thermodynamics, most of chemistry thermodynamics. There's lots of places where there's a very fuzzy line between uh, chemistry and physics. So I'm not gonna get into that fight. Um, and there's also space in here for say mechanical engineering and civil engineering thermodynamics, which um, tend to be kind of smaller circles focused very closely on uh, systems and cycles. So the things we were worrying about in chemical engineering thermo is temperatures between maybe 70 K and a thousand ish plus or minus K, right? We don't want to go, we don't tend to go down to zero K um, unless you're in grad school or in a very specialized area. And we don't tend to go way, way above thousand K. We don't tend to go, you know, to the heat, the center of the sun. And in our space, our reactions and vapor liquid equilibrium and the description of fluid properties, especially when those fluids are of commercial interest, uh, like traditionally uh, petroleum products. And we overlap um, a lot with our friends, the chemists, uh, but not, uh, not exclusively. They, uh, they tend to focus a bit on uh, fundamental models, understanding what the molecules are doing. There's some chemists who do that too, but that's more their driving force and our driving force tends to be more commercial application. Inside this whole box, as I said before, is physics. And it, can, uh, it carries on looking at the minimization of free energy in ways that we, as chemical engineers, are mostly happy to assume are stable. So for example, the fact that atoms themselves are not stable on the life of the universe timescale. And that pretty much by the end of everything, it's all gonna be back to, uh, I think, hydrogen, maybe lead. Um, uh, stuff will eventually fall apart and we will get to the heat death of the universe where there's no more you know, possible delta H, so it's all gone to entropy. But that cheerful note, is not our problem as chemical engineers because we are in a, a subset of this space where we are not worried necessarily about what happens several billion years from now. Yay. At last, we arrive at our problem of the day. And it centers on this idea that uh, it's not the case that uh, different forms of uh, minimization of free energy happen independently of each other. These things are all happening all the time. So that is, we have to think about 
energy and entropy balances in concert with thinking about description of fluid properties slash uh, equilibrium between phases and solubility. And we also have to think about reactions. All of those things are on all the time. Um, and that's how the natural world works. Now, how we work is we have to remember to kind of add in different terms that we shouldn't be neglecting, right? We need to say, oh, am I in a case where reactions are going to be important? I better put that equation set into my mind. Um, and the other thing, that uh, realm where it's not automatic, is a tool such as, say, Hysis or Aspen, where that machine doesn't necessarily know what way it's minimizing free energy until you tell it, turn on these uh, equations. So let's imagine we were running the chemical plant that is doing steam reformation of methane to make hydrogen. And let's walk through all of the different thermodynamic applications that we see in even the simplest version of this plant. So simple version of this plant, we bring in natural gas, we bring in water as a liquid, and we gotta heat them up to reactor temperature. So we have heat exchangers, we have some form of mixer, stuff goes into the reactor uh, where we hope it will react. And now we have a mixture of products and reactants, or at least the products are a mixture, right? There's hydrogen and there's carbon monoxide. So we're gonna have to send that into some form of separation. The most convenient separation is usually gonna be distillation, but because we're distillating, distillating, oh my gosh, distilling carbon monoxide, uh, this is, well, I don't, you know, we're going to be operating at non-conventional temperatures and pressures. It's going to be cryogenic. We got to cool this whole thing way down so that we have some of these streams uh, as a liquid. And so where do we see the need to do energy and entropy balances? Well, certainly in those heat exchangers, uh, certainly in the reactor, right? There's going to be an energy balance around the reactor. There's a delta H of reaction. Um, and energy and entropy are important on every stage of that distillation column and in the reboiler and the condenser. That's happening all over this. Okay, so that's pretty fundamental. So that's a way we have to think about our minimization of free energy. And uh, possibly also, actually, in the mixer, because depending on how this mixture works, uh, we might have important changes, maybe. Uh, in this case, we're mixing two gases, so it's probably not a big deal. Now, where do we have to worry about fluid property modeling and phase equilibrium? Well, that's certainly happening in the boiler as we're turning our water into steam. It may, maybe not, but it may uh, be an issue in the reactor because uh, keep in mind, there's steam going into the reactor, but it's an endothermic reaction. So uh, maybe we'll have some phase change in there if we have appreciable water left. Um, and then, obviously, in a separation, especially if it's a distillation separation, we worry a lot about phase change and how mixtures uh, achieve uh, vapor-liquid equilibrium, you know, the different purities on the different stages here. Uh, and then finally, where are we worrying about reactions? Well, we are definitely worrying about reactions in the reactor. We might be worrying about them elsewhere uh, because it's not like reactions just snap, turn off. Um, we try to control that because, of course, the, the catalyst won't be present anywhere else. So the reaction will be very slow elsewhere. Uh, but that doesn't mean it won't ultimately happen. And there's other reactions that may be occurring. Uh, when I took a uh, tour of uh, a uh, petroleum plant in California to learn about safety, they mentioned that at very high pressures, hydrogen eventually, over time, dissolves into the steel that the pipes are made out of. And uh, that does bad things. Uh, so, you know, not a reaction or a phase change you would have thought of, but over time, it's there. So what is your problem? I want you, this is not going to have a numerical answer, I want you to go through this PFD, or create your own that's very much like this, and write for yourself the governing equations for each of these uh, systems as we come through, um, and think about what you need to worry about and what you would choose to not worry about. What are things that you feel that are, are probably okay to neglect, or at least okay to neglect at a first pass in the design? And 
how far could we get if we pick up this plant and try and transfer it into Hysis? How far can we get with it? Can we make something react? So that's your problem of the day and uh, let's get to work.